Okay, Psalm 2. Why don't you open your Bibles to Psalm 2. We're going to be in uh, Revelation chapter 11 uh, in our study, but I wanted to read out of Psalms this morning. And let's all stand, and I'll read it out loud. You guys can follow along with me. <clears throat> this is a prophetic psalm. It's a, a psalm about the second coming of Jesus. And in verse 1, it says, Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord. And against his anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. Verse 4, he who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The, decree. the Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a, a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Let's stop right there and let's pray. And Father, we uh, just want to commit the study into your hands. Lord, we know that um, you love to speak to us through your word. And God, as we're going through the passages that we're going to be dealing with, God, we just pray that you'd speak clearly. And Lord, we especially want to pray that you'd be touching the hearts of those who may be here this morning who don't know you yet. And Lord, just show them how real you are and um, how serious uh, some of the issues that we're going through and that we're going to be going through are, and uh, Lord, that they need to make a decision. And so, God, we just uh, give you the time this morning and pray that you bless it in the name of Jesus. Amen. You can have a seat. Um, a couple of things in this passage. Uh, like I said, it's a, it's a passage that's speaking about the, the second coming of Christ. The Bible talks about when Jesus comes back that the nations of the earth are going to be gathered against him to try to resist the second coming. And that's what is um, being spoken about in uh, verse 2 and verse 3. It says, The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. The word anointed um, in Old Testament Hebrew is uh, uh, Mashiach. It's Messiah. And when it's translated into Greek, that's Christ. And so the word Christ and the word Messiah both mean anointed. And so that's speaking about Jesus there. It says, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. In other words, it's a rebellion against God. But it says in verse 4, he who sits in the heavens uh, shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. And so God just, he's just chuckling about their, you know, their big rebellion. It's like, what are you, you, you going to do to stop me? It's one of those kinds of things. It's kind of like when my wife tries to beat me up, I, I chuckle. <laughs> I got 100 pounds on the lady. I got better than 100 pounds on her. I can take her. <laughs> then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. And this is why I wanted to go back and look at this. Verse 6, it says, yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. The idea there is, despite the fact that you are in rebellion against it, despite the fact that you don't want it to happen, despite the fact that you're sitting here rising up against me, I have still set my king on the holy hill of Zion. And it's, it's that kind of idea. So it's a song about the second coming, and it's a song about the rebellion that's going to be taking place right before the second coming. And that's where we're at in, in Revelation. If you go back over to Revelation chapter 11, we're going to be dealing with the, <clears throat> with the last part of chapter 11. That's verses 15 through 19. And I'm going to just stop right, right there because I don't want to get into chapter 12 this morning. Um, it doesn't look like a whole lot, but I can make anything long. <laughs> Let's read verses 15 through 19. It says, then, then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders, verse 16, 
who sat before God on their thrones, fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. That's why we read Psalm 2. And the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple, and there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, and earthquake, and great hail. Now this whole thing, um, this whole last trumpet is after the parenthesis that we, we have in um, chapter uh, chapters 10, and the first part of chapter 11. You'll remember the structure in the book of Revelation is every time that they have a series of judgments, there's seven ju or six judgments, and then there, there's a parenthesis where there's good things going on. It's an encouragement to the reader, where there's good things going on, and then finally you have the seventh judgment, and that's what, what you have in this passage. This seventh judgment is also called the third woe. You remember that? Um, if you go back to Revelation, let's do it. Uh, go back to Revelation uh, chapter uh, chapter eight in verse thirteen it says and I looked and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice woe 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 to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blasts of the tr three uh, angels who are about to sound and if you look in chapter nine down in verse twelve it says one woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. And um, that was the, the fifth trumpet. We're not going to go back through the fifth trumpet, but the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh trumpets are also called the three woes. And in, if you look over in chapter 10, in verse 7, it says, But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, which is what we just read, um, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants the prophets. Okay, uh, Part of the reason I'm telling you that is because I think that, uh, uh, when I go through and teach the book of Revelation, there's another structure that's going on in the, in the passage. And the structure is that the story is being told over and over and over, and it ends up at the same place every single time. In fact, um, if you look up in chapter 11, in verse 13, it says, In the same hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were uh, afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe was passed. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. And then if you look at verse 19, it says, Then the temple of God was opened in heaven. You see the Ark of the Covenant. And at the end there it says, And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, and earthquake and great hail. And one of the things that you see at the end of every series of judgments is this great earthquake and great hail coming down. In the first uh, series of judgments in, in uh, the sixth uh, seal, you, it talks about the stars of heaven falling to the earth. And in the other two, uh, uh, the end of the other two judgments in chapter uh, 11 here and also in chapter 16, it talks about great hail. And that word for hail, it can mean ice, but it can mean rocks too. It's the idea of something falling from the heavens. And so in all these instances, you have thunderings, lightnings, earthquakes, every single time that you have the, have the end of the judgments, and you have this great earthquake, and then you have things falling out of the sky. And so it looks to me as we're going through the book of Revelation that again what God's doing is he's showing this stuff over and over. Another thing that you have is the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem is uh, um, destroyed in this, in this passage. It talks about uh, the, this earthquake that knocks down part of the city. You have the same thing in uh, the seventh uh, bold judgment. You have the destruction again of the city of Jerusalem. There's a great earthquake. And it's not just the city of Jerusalem. It's all the cities of the nations fall um, in Revelation uh, chapter 16. Back in Revelation chapter 6, it's not just the, the, all the cities of the nations that fall, it's all the high mountains are torn down 
in this earthquake. So you got a cataclysm that's taken place if you're taking the book of Revelation seriously. Also in chapter 16 of the book of Revelation, it says exactly the same thing, that all the high mountains, all, all the islands disappear. And so you have this huge earthquake, this, this shaking that takes place on the planet. Um, and in, again, in, in this passage, this is the seventh trumpet. There is a series of judgments. Uh, actually, there's a, there's a judgment that takes place in the Old Testament that involves seven trumpets and an earthquake, or what looks to be an earthquake. You know what it is? It's Joshua and Jericho. Remember that story? What happens is Joshua uh, has the priests go out in front of the people of Israel with the Ark of the Covenant. These guys are going out blowing seven ram's horns. And they do this every single day. They, they make these blasts on these ram, ram horns one, uh, every day for seven days. And then on the seventh day, when they blast on these ram's horns, then Joshua tells all the people to shout. And what happens? The walls of Jericho come down and they go in and they take the city. And there's, a, there's kind of a parallel between the book of Revelation and the book of Joshua. It's really interesting. When we've gone through Joshua, that's one of the things that I've, that I've pointed out. And in this passage, what you have again is this falling down of the nations, not only this passage, but in chapter 16, the, an earthquake destroying the cities of men. And in this passage right here, it talks about the fact that the Lord's going to reign. Again, in verse 15, it says, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Without their permission, he's going to reign forever and ever. Nobody votes Jesus into office. He comes back and he takes what's his. You know, one of the things that, that you see in uh, Matthew's gospel and in, in the other gospels, when you have the death of Jesus, the death of Jesus paid for stuff. And one of the things that Jesus's death paid for was my sin. And that's real familiar to us. That's the, that's the essence of the gospel. Gospel means good news. And the good news is that I don't have to pay for my own sin. Jesus paid for it for me. And the reason that that happened isn't just because Jesus is a nice guy. It's because Jesus is a nice guy, but it's also pointing to the fact that I couldn't pay for it myself. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And if I'm going to pay for my sin, I'm not going to do it by writing a check to Calvary Chapel or writing a check to missions or doing church attendance, that kind of stuff. The payment for my sin is death. And so everybody who has sinned, the Bible says, will die. The soul that sins, it shall die, said God. And so what God did was he sent his son to die in your place and in my place, and that's the essence of the gospel. Jesus died in my place so that I could go to heaven. I'm not going to heaven because I'm a church attender or because I'm being nice or because I'm reading a Bible or because I'm praying. I'm going to heaven because Jesus paid the price for me and I accepted the payment in my life. All that other stuff is important, but the reason I'm going to heaven is because Jesus traded places with me, literally. And so the Bible says that he who knew no sin became sin so that I and you could become the righteousness of God in him. Literally trading places. That's the idea. And so whenever you're thinking about the gospel, that's what it is. That's why the death of Jesus is so important. He traded places. So Jesus deserves heaven. I do not. Jesus takes my punishment so that I can get his reward. And that's the way that it works. And it doesn't work any other way. That's why Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Nobody else paid for your sin. It's only Jesus that's done it. And that's why, that's why Jesus is exclusive. That's why he, when he teaches, he teaches exclusively. In, the, in other words, I'm the only way to God. There's no other way. And it doesn't matter what you think about it. That's why he says that kind of stuff. Not only did Jesus pay for my sin, and it's literally the idea of payment. Not only did he pay my, for my sin, he paid to get what was mine out of hock. The Bible teaches that when you become a slave, and you are a slave to sin, if you don't know Jesus, when you become a slave, not only are you sold into slavery, but everything that you have is sold into slavery. And when mankind fell, what happened was they became slaves. Adam and Eve became slaves to sin. You're slaves to whom you obey. 
whether of sin unto death or of righteousness unto life. It says in Romans chapter 16. So Adam and Eve became slaves, and so did everyone that was born from them. That's called original sin. It's been passed down. I'm not a sinner because I sin. I'm, I'm a sinner because I, it's just in me. I'm just a sinner. And that's called original sin, passed down. Um, from everybody since Adam. Not only did they pass down their sin, but they lost their inheritance. God had given them the planet. And after they sinned, what happened was the planet was given over into the hands of Satan. Satan's real. And the world was given over to his hands. And you can tell that in Matthew chapter 4 and also in Luke chapter 3. In those passages, there is this uh, temptation of Jesus. And in one of those temptations, what Satan says to Jesus is, if you'll bow down to me, I will give you all the kingdoms of the earth. I'll just give them to you because they're mine to give to whom I will. And Jesus doesn't say, no, they're not. He just says, shut up. <laughs> it's there in the Greek. Um, no. <laughs> He basically says, you know, he says, uh, the Lord is the only one that we bow before, the only one that we worship, and the only one that we're going to serve, that, that kind of thing. And the argument goes on. Actually, that ends the argument right there. In any case, Jesus doesn't combat that whole thing. And so Satan is called the God of this world. The Bible says the God of this world has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. So Satan's the one in control of things. And when Jesus dies on the cross, not only does he die to pay for my sin and get me out of slavery to Satan and to sin, not only does he get me out of slavery, he buys my stuff back too. And my stuff is the planet. Jesus said the meek will inherit the earth. And he meant it. He meant it. Because he's coming back not only to buy you, he's buying the earth too. And this is where he comes back to get it. He's going to reign on this planet, and it doesn't matter what people think. I like that. You know, um, one of the problems that we have with uh, our um, political system is, well, first off, people don't really know what our political, actually, I can't say people. Lots of people in America don't know how our political system is supposed to work. We're not a democracy, we're a representative, representative republic. And so the people that we elect are supposed to go to Washington, D.C. and other places, you know, over to Olympia and stuff like that, and they are supposed to represent us. And so basically what we're doing is we're trusting the wisdom of these people. We elect them, and we don't call them every day and tell them what they're supposed to do. They're not our bosses, or they're not our um, employees in that sense. What we're supposed to be doing is taking wise men, putting them in office so that they can make wise decisions, and we're trusting them, okay? So you're putting a trust, you're putting trust in a politician. Is that scary? Yeah, and the reason it's scary is because what we've got uh, over in Washington and in other places are a bunch of people who are um, basically, they're, a lot of times they're egotistical, and they don't have a clue. It's amazing the people that, that the United States populace puts in office, and it's just a scary thing. And then on top of it, what these guys are doing is they're not ruling by their wisdom because... That could be problematic. Um, <laughs> they're ruling by polls. And so what ends up happening is we end up with a democracy, and democracies always fall apart. It's supposed to be a representative republic. So wise guys, I don't mean it, you know, with a pun, but wise men are supposed to be put in places of rulership by people who are looking for guys who are wise so that they can rule in a... Um, uh, righteous manner, and that's all broken down. So we got a uh, again. We've got a situation where everything's falling apart on us because of the whole sin issue. You know what we need? We need a dictator who is absolutely good. We need somebody who can who can do what's right all the time, and he never does what's wrong, and he's got absolute authority. That's what we need, and we're not getting it until Jesus comes back. You know, and uh, again, that's the situation in this passage. He's going to rule. He's going to rule without their permission. And he has come to redeem the purchased possession. He purchased the world with his blood. 
and now he's going to come and he's going to take it. Verse 16, it says, and the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God. Now we ran into the 24 elders all the way back in chapter four. Um, these guys most likely represent the church. They are priests and kings. They say of themselves, they're priests and kings, and they have been redeemed by the blood of the lamb. That, that um, description only fits the church. When you have 24 priests, 24 elders, um, what you have is a, uh, oh gosh, do I want to get into this again? Um, in the Old Testament, you had a priesthood, okay? It was called the, Iran, or the uh, uh, Levitical priesthood. And in the Levitical priesthood, you had 24 courses of priests. And what that meant is uh, 24 groups of priests, and they got to serve in the temple two times a year, okay? Um, and what would happen is when they would get together for a meeting, they would, these priests would elect one elder from each one of their courses. So for example, in, in the book of Luke, remember Zechariah is in the temple and he's from the course of Abijah. That's, that's uh, John the Baptist's dad. And so he's a priest from the course of Abijah. It was his turn to serve in the temple. And so when those, when those 24 elders of the priests got together, you had the whole priesthood represented. And so that's, that's, the, that's where you get the number 24. 24 guys crowned, seated on thrones, redeemed by the lamb. That's a picture of the church. And so what you have here is when this takes place, when there's this loud voice in heaven saying the kingdoms of the world have become the kingdoms of our, of our, uh, of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down and worship God. The results of that announcement are number one in heaven, there's worship. These guys fall down and worship. Number two, there is thanksgiving. It says in verse 17, they say, we give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who was and is and is to come. Or excuse me, the one who is and who was and who is to come because you have taken your great power and you've reigned. Worship, thanksgiving, and thirdly, there's approval. There's approval. You've taken your great power and reigned. And it's the idea of it's about time. We're glad that you're doing it. It's about time. And one of the things that you see all the way through the book of Revelation is every time that God does something, you have the approval of heaven. You have appro the approval of all the people who are in heaven. And that obviously, if the 24 elders represents a church, includes you. You're going to be bowing down, you're going to be worshiping, and you're going to go, well done, God you finally reigned with your great power, okay? The reason that I'm saying that is because a lot of people, a lot of times people think that they sit in judgment of God and they disapprove of him. They disapprove of what he's doing. They disapprove of what he's done. They disapprove of what he hasn't done or what, what they think he hasn't done. And they've got all kinds of judgments that they, that they just pass out against God all the time. And they don't know what they're talking about. You know what, when you get into heaven, and you see the things that God's doing. When you get into heaven, you see every, everything that he does and the reasons that he does it, and you see the big picture, you are going to be in absolute approval of everything that the guy's ever done. And so you might as well get used to it. One of the things that, um, again, is uh, a situation that we have in uh, the United States, and not just the United States, in the world uh, um, also, is this whole attitude towards authority. And I grew up in a military household, and so I don't have huge attitudes towards authority. If somebody's in charge of something, then I just let them be in charge of it. And if I'm, you know, I'm on a number of boards um, uh, for a number of churches and a number of different organizations, and the, the guy that God put in place in those areas is the guy that God put in place in those areas. And so what I do is I offer counsel and I talk to them about stuff and what they're supposed to be doing, what they're supposed to be doing is hearing from God, doing the things that God wants them to do, and I'm supposed to be there to support them, okay? That's how authority structures go, is that there's, there's a guy who's in charge and then everybody who is under him is supposed to support him. I'm not saying that for our church. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about that whole issue. If you've got problems with that, you got problems with God. Because that's how God sets things up. He sets that up in church government. He sets that up in, um, 
you, in uh, like just regular government, we're supposed to be submitting to the people that are in, our, are in authority over us. He sets that up in marriages. He sets that up in parental child relationships. He sets that up all the time. Well, what about the people who are jerks? Can God take care of the people who are jerks? Yeah, absolutely. And does, does God say that, that my submission to authority is supposed to be absolute? Only to his, not to anybody else's. And so there are times when I've been in, in situations where somebody's been in authority over me and I just, I just tell them what's up. I don't tell them in a disrespectful manner. I don't get all up in their face and that kind of stuff. But I'll tell them what's up and, and that kind of thing. And then I'll just go right back to submission. It's a, you know, it's a simple thing. I don't have to run everything. And people who have to run everything, just they're ridiculous. They're ridiculous. You don't run God. And again, that's the point that I'm making here. You don't run God. He's not sitting there listening every day, wondering what you're going to say to him. What, you know, what should I do now? Should I get, you know, Michael, give Steve a ring. You know, I need to know what's, what needs to happen on the, world now, on the world stage right now. God knows exactly what he's doing. He knows what he's doing all the time. And he knows what he's doing in my life. I've gone through all kinds of trials in my life. And when I was a young believer, there were times when I was asking God, what in the world are you doing? And I don't do that anymore. I know, you know, it's like I've got some experience with the guy. He's squared away. He always does it right. Always does it right. And I, I almost never know the whole story. Almost never do I know the whole story. There have been times when I've wondered about what God was doing and why he did certain things. And then a year later, somebody comes into my office or I get, the, I get news from something and I'm like, oh, there, that's why he did that. That's what was going on. And, ha and it's happened to me over and over and over and over again. I trust him. I trust him. Do you trust him? Are there things in your life that are, you know, where things have happened and you're just wondering why God did that or why God allowed it and, and that kind of thing? Or do you, do you trust him or not? Is he good or not? Is he out to get you? Is he trying to wreck your life? And what you're going to find is that if you think that right now and you're a believer, you're going to be standing in heaven and you're going to be embarrassed. You're going to be embarrassed because God has always done it right. He's always done what's right by you every single time, every single issue, every single event. He's always done what's right by you. And you need to, you need to understand that. When you get to heaven, everything that God does, you're going to be looking at it and you're going to go, I approve. That's awesome. Well done, God. And God's not looking for your approval, but that's what you're going to be doing. And so, again, when you're going through trials... You need to understand um, who you're dealing with. And um, you can see that in, in various guys in the Bible. Jacob, or not, excuse me, not Jacob, Joseph is a really good example of that. He's a, he's a guy who's looking at the trials that he went through. And if you want to talk about trials, have, you ever, have your brothers ever sold you into slavery? You know, hasn't happened. You ever been accused of rape falsely? Hasn't happened. Have, you know, well, actually for most people it hasn't happened. Have you been, ever been thrown in prison for it? You know, and you go through that whole thing, at the end of that whole series of events when Jacob is, or excuse me, Joseph is standing before his brothers and, you know, everything comes out. What happens there is Joseph looks at these guys and he goes, you know what, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And Joseph approves of everything that's gone on in his life. He approves. He's like, God, God had me in this place. He had me in this place for a reason. And he understands the whole thing. Now, did God want Joseph in prison and all that kind of stuff? No, absolutely not. But what God did was he took all the tweaked things that people were doing around Joseph and to Joseph, and he turned them into something awesome. And we live in a tweaked world that's fallen, and there's all kinds of tweaked people who are around us. And God doesn't just wipe them off the map. He's got other things going. And he's got things going with me and he's going to protect me and he's going to watch out for me. And he's got things going with them too. And sometimes the them that we're talking about are people that we don't want God to have anything going with except for hellfire. We want them to go to hell and suffer forever, right? And most people wouldn't go, yeah. <laughs> but some, sometimes that's how we act. And God, God cares about them in the same way that he cares about me. 
And so sometimes he'll allow me to go through things and he's got good things planned for me and he's going to be watching out for me. And the reason that he's doing it is because he not only wants to reach me, he's already got me. He wants to reach them too. See what I mean? And so you've gone through some trials in your life where they have done things to you and you're wondering why God allowed it. And I don't know all the reasons for that, but when you get to heaven, what's going to happen is you're going to go, oh, I get it. If you don't start doing that now. There, there, there are times in my life where I've wondered again what God was doing when he allowed certain things to go on in my life. And, you know, God just kind of revealed things to me through circumstances and through people saying things and that kind of stuff. And I went, oh, that's what's going on. Okay, got it. I'm good with it. And that's what's going to happen when you get to heaven. You're going to be good with everything that God has done. You're going to prove him of, of what he's done. So again, what God does is good and it's righteous and it's, it's just the way that it's supposed to be. When God extends grace, he extends grace for a reason. When God judges, he judges for a reason. When God puts off judgment, he puts off judgment for a reason. And everything that he does, again, is righteous. So you have, again, the approval there. It goes on in verse um, 18, and it says, the nations were angry and your wrath has come. That phrase, your wrath has come, literally means your wrath has taken place. We read Psalm 2 where it talks about the nations being angry and it's just about the, the fact that these guys are in rebellion against God. And later on when we get to uh, chapters 13 and 14 and then also in uh, chapter uh, 16 of Revelation, you see this uh, total rebellion against God with literally the nations bringing their armies together against him. There are a couple of passages in the Old Testament. Joel 3, 9 through 13 says this, Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble and come, all you nations, and gather together all around. Um, cause your mighty ones to go down there, O Lord. Let the nations be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, go down, for the wine press is full. The vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. And it's a passage talking about the fact that um, even though it's the enemies of God who are gathering the nations, it's God himself who has that in mind. It's his plan to bring them together to the valley of Jehoshaphat, which is in Israel, so that he can judge them. They're not coming to rebel against him. They're coming so that he can judge them. And later on in, in uh, chapter 14, it pictures um, an angel sticking a sickle into a um, group of grapes and reaping them. And um, literally it talks about blood flowing because of this reaping that's going on. And it's talking about these battles that are going to take place at the end of the tribulation period. Um, in Zechariah 14, we um, had been talking about Jerusalem. And in the context of Jerusalem, it says, I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. This is Zechariah 14, 2 through 4. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, and the women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. The Mount of Olives shall be split in two from the east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half of it toward the south. And again, that's a description of the second coming. When Christ comes back, he touches down on the Mount of Olives, and the Bible says the Mount of Olives splits in two. Did you know that there's a fault in the Mount of Olives running north-south? So if, that, if, it, if it broke on that fault, literally the mountain would split in two, just like the Bible talks about. And it's at the, at the point where the city of Jerusalem is being taken, and there's a battle going on for the city of Jerusalem that Christ comes back and he returns. And he returns and he stops that whole battle. It talks about the, the fact that your wrath has come. Literally, your wrath has taken place. In Acts 17.31, Paul was talking to a group of Gentiles and he's, he was talking about the fact that God is a judge. He's the creator and he's our judge. 
And in chapter 17 and verse 31, it says, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. There's a judgment coming. And actually, there's a number of judgments coming. This judgment against these nations that are in rebellion against against Jesus takes place at the second coming. There's another judgment that takes place right after that where he gathers the remnants of the Gentile nations before him and he separates them like a a shepherd separates separates the sheep from the goats. That's in Matthew 25. And he judges them. And as you go through the book of, uh, as we as we're going through the book of Revelation, we see these different um, uh, plagues and these different cataclysms that are coming down on the earth, and they're all judgments against the earth because of their wickedness. There's, you know, God's going to finally get done with everything, and that's what's happening in these passages. God is done, and He's judging. Not only, um, obviously, is He going to be judging them. He's going to be judging us, too. There's a passage in Romans chapter 2. Why don't you turn over there? Romans chapter 2, where it talks about God's judgment. And it talks about the fact that it, that, that judgment is without respect of persons. God of all things is fair. And in Romans chapter 2, in verse 4, it says, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? But in, accordan- in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds eternal life to those who by patient um, continuance and doing good seeks for glory, honor, and immortality, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first and also of the Greek. And again, the point is that God judges and he doesn't do it with respect of persons. Um, the reason that Paul's doing this in Romans chapter 2 is because he's writing to Gentiles in chapter 1, saying that your judgment is going to be totally fair because you've turned away from God. You knew what was right, and you did what was wrong. And in uh, Romans chapter 2, he's speaking to the Jewish nation, and he's saying, God's going to judge you too. Religious people get judged and judged on the basis of what's true. And so we need to remember that when we're dealing with God, we're dealing with somebody who is absolutely fair. He doesn't just let things go. Well, what about grace? Yeah, there's grace. Absolutely there's grace. I stand, I stand before Jesus based on, on the salvation that he's given to me on his grace. That doesn't mean that I get a free pass on every snotty thing that I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Do you get a free pass on those things now? Do you? You go up and you're, you act mean to people, you, you trash them, you, uh, you do whatever, you get ticked off at them and you say all kinds of nasty things to their face. Do you walk away from that without the Holy Spirit convicting you? No, never. Do you ever get spanked by God? How many of you have been spanked by God? Raise your hands. Yeah. Do you think that that's not going to continue? When we stand before Jesus, we're going to get spanked by God if you haven't repented. One of the things that the Bible's clear on is that if I confess my sins, he's faithful and he's just to forgive me my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. When I confess my sins, does God remember them? Nope, doesn't remember them. Actually, God's the only one in the universe who can absolutely forget. And so when I confess my sins before God, what God does is forget them. So you guys who are sitting there going, oh no, I've got a lot of sin. <laughs> if you haven't repented of those things, then yeah, you do. But if you, ha- if you have, then what God does is he throws them into the sea of forgetfulness and he remembers them no more. But the point that I'm making here is I know all kinds of Christians who think that they're going to get away with all kinds of stuff, and they're not. They're not. So there's a judgment not only of unbelievers, but there's a judgment of believers too. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, look at this. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 
Verse 9. It says, therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And he's talking to Christians. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men for we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your consciences. Do you have a terror of the Lord? You know, most times when, when I'm preaching, and actually most people that I know, when we're, when we're preaching, when we're talking about God, we're talking about his love towards us and his grace towards us, and it's absolutely true. Do you know the terror of the Lord? Yeah, the Bible talks about the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fear of the Lord's beginning of understanding. There's a fear of the Lord that I'm supposed to have. There's a terror of the Lord that I'm supposed to have. I don't want to be standing, you know, Jesus knows everything that I've done. The Bible says that all the things that have been done in secret are going to be shouted from the house, from the housetops, from the rooftops. And that's not talking to unbelievers. It's talking to believers. And so I need to consider that when I'm walking with Christ, my walk with Christ needs to be real. No plastic, no fake stuff, absolutely real. The only thing that Jesus ever railed against when you go through and you look at the Gospels is religious hypocrisy, where if you, you have one face on the outside and another thing going on, on the inside. You have one face to one group of people and you have another face to another group of people. Religious hypocrisy is all that Jesus ever railed against. And we need to understand that he's not gonna put up with, that, with it in us either. Okay, so now having said all that, um, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And when it talks about the judgment of believers, it's not talking about a judgment that's um, given to them for salvation. It's a judgment for rewards. I'm saved by the blood of Jesus. That doesn't mean that God gives me a pass on everything. I'm supposed to have a righteous life and I'm supposed to be walking with him, okay? And so he's gonna correct me and he's going to discipline me and he's going to change me into his image. It's part of the, part of the point of what's got, what God's doing in my life right now. You guys get that? So um, you guys have children. If your children act up, are they banned from your family? No, they're not. Are they disciplined? Yes. Is there this back and forth thing going on? Sometimes they're doing well and sometimes they're doing badly. And when they're doing badly, do you throw them out of the house? No. Well, it depends. <laughs> Get outside and play. You know, that kind of, <laughs> that kind of stuff. No, you're not throwing them outside the house. They're still, they're still your family. They're still your children right? But they get disciplined, just like we do with the Lord. This is, you know, a lot of people get, get all flipped out by this stuff, and I just don't. And I don't because, you know, it's like I'm a dad, and I discipline my kids, and there's sometimes when the discipline is strict, and it's intense, and there's sometimes when it's more of a teaching type of thing, um, but they get disciplined, and they get directed in the way that they're supposed to go. And I, that's what happens with me, too, with the Lord, I get disciplined. Sometimes it's strict and it's intense, and sometimes it's more of a teaching thing. That's not what I want you to do. I want you to go over here, and that kind of thing. And so it's not a big deal to me, the, the whole judgment of God thing. If I'm living my life in a sense where I don't want to be embarrassed when Jesus gets back, then there's going to be a reality to it. And that's what God's looking for. He's looking for reality. And it's going to happen whether you want it to or not. And you can fool me and you can fool the people who are around you, but you can't fool God ever. And so God's going, to, God's going to have it his way. And so we might as well just be real in the first place. In 1 Corinthians 3, when it's, when it's talking about the judgment that um, we stand before um, Jesus on, in verse 11, it says, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work 
which um, he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. And then he says, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? And he goes on in the passage. And so when we stand before Christ, what's going to happen is our lives are gonna be judged and our works are gonna be judged. And there's gonna be good works and there's gonna be bad works and the bad works he's going to deal with just like he deals with them now. I get rebuked now. And so I expect that when I stand before Jesus in heaven, there's gonna be stuff that I've done that I'm, not, I'm clueless to. In, in, the, in the sense that, you know, I just got a blind spot or whatever. And he's going to be going, what in the world were you doing? What were you thinking? He does that with me all the time. And so I don't expect that when I'm standing before Christ, it's going to be any different that, than that. If I've got stuff where I have just refused to do the things that God wants me to, I've just refused to do them. Do you not think that he's not going to bring that up when I'm standing before him? And the answer is yes, he's gonna bring that up. And so he's going to judge my works, the good and the bad. Now those are the bad works. In this passage, all it's talking about is the good works. So the bad works don't get any reward at all. They just get judged, okay? Then I have good works and I have stuff that um, I have been building on the foundation that was laid in my life. The, the foundation is Jesus. And then I have all these good works that I have been putting on that foundation over the years. And each one of those good works is going to be tested, like the passage says, as though by fire. And it's the idea that um, what God's going to do is he's going to um, check them out and see what they were really about. Okay, so anytime that I'm ministering to somebody, any anytime that I'm serving God in some kind of area, Sunday school, whatever. There, there are all the, always those times where I'm doing it with a, with a true heart and I just wanna serve Jesus and I wanna serve the people, right? And then there, was the, there are those times where I'm getting tired of it, okay? And so I'm thinking of uh, when, I, when I was younger and I ran a Sunday school. So I go to church and it's like, there were certain kids in the Sunday school that I started out with and I was like, oh, I just really wanna reach this kid. And I, you know, Jesus, you need him and I pray for him and you need to do a work in him and, and that kind of stuff. And then he keeps acting up and he keeps up acting up. And then I'm like, God, you know, I wanna kill him. <laughs> and Jesus, you need to help me not to, not to want to destroy his life. You need to help me not to want to, you know, take his parents and choke them. You know, and that, that kind of stuff. And, you know, and even that's okay, right? And then there are times where, I, where I'm just going through the motions and I'm just doing it because, and then there are times when all that stuff is mixed up together, right? And so I walk in the, walk in the room, there's little Johnny, and I'm like, oh, Jesus, just help little Johnny. And that's the first five minutes of the class. And, and then somewhere in there, it's like, oh, Jesus, I want to kill little Johnny. Please help me not to. And then finally I'm like, God, I don't care if you help me not to or not, I'm just gonna kill him. You know, and then I get back to, oh, you know, I shouldn't be like that. You know, there's this whole mixture of things that are going on. Well, do you think that God doesn't see that? And when I stand before the Lord, is he, is he gonna be, you know, going, oh, Steve, well done. You wanted to kill little Johnny. Here, receive a crown for that. No, he's not. That stuff's gonna get all burnt up and all the stuff that's good is gonna, gonna be left. And in the end, what we're going to stand before God with is not the stuff that we've shown to other people, not the stuff that we've pretended to be, but we're gonna be left standing before God and before everyone else with what we really are. And that's a judgment that receivers believe, or excuse me, believers receive. <laughs> Isn't that scary? It's kind of scary, huh? Everybody, everybody's gonna know exactly what it is. Exactly what it is. So all the little games that church people play are stupid. That's stupid. You don't live like that. You live like Jesus is with you every single day. Just genuine, just genuine before him. And any other life is, is just, you know, it's really, it's really pointless. It's really pointless. But again, in the end, what happens is we're standing before Christ and we're in heaven because of what Jesus has done and all the rewards that we, we get are going to be those things that Jesus has done through us. 
which is cool, and they're all going to be real. Everything's real in heaven. That's one of the things I like, I like the most about um, heaven and rewards and judgments and all that kind of stuff. Everything's real. And so in that passage, back over in Revelation 11, let's, let's wrap this up. In that passage, it talks about um, nations were angry, your wrath has come, verse 18, in the time of the dead that they should be judged and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints. And that's you. You get a reward. And those who fear your name, small and great. And again, there's that fear there. And it's not a cringing from God. It's just a, it's just a recognition that he knows. And he's going to do what's right in a situation, whether I like it or not. And that you should destroy those who destroy the earth. God's going to destroy those who destroy the earth. Um, you know, when, when, um, when I was a kid, and I got, saved, I got saved in 1975, when I was a kid, there was a movement called the uh, ecological movement. Now we call them the greenies and, and that kind of stuff and, uh, um, and, and that kind of thing. And there was, a, there was a real movement to preserve the planet. And there were some reasons for that. There was, there was all kinds of, you know, some of you guys that are older, you remember some of the pollution that was going on in the United States. Lake Erie was almost dead. And uh, you had like the Hudson River was, you know, and I don't, I don't know how much cleaner the Hudson River is. I know it's significantly cleaner than it was back in the 70s. And you had this stuff all over the United States where people were just pumping chemicals into streams and stuff like that. And, and uh, then I lived in Southern California with smog. You know, have you heard these alerts around here where there's not good air dispersion and people with asthma should, shouldn't go outside and stuff like that, you know? Do you take those things seriously? I mock you. <laughs> You've never seen air pollution. You don't even know what air pollution is. How many of you are from Southern California? I do not mock you. <laughs> air pollution, you know, when I, when I played football, um, uh, I, uh, uh, I, my uh, freshman year in college, um, I was playing football and we were on this field and we're about a mile away from a hill that's called Mount Rubido. And it's, it's just like any of the hills that are around here, a mile away from this hill. And when the smog would come in, it would literally make Mount Rubido disappear. You couldn't see it. It's like, the, it's like fog that we have here. Not, 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 not intense fog, but you couldn't see a mile away. It was just this gray haze that would come in. And it was so bad that guys across the football field, not end to end, across the football field for me when we were practicing, they were fuzzy. That's how bad the smog is. And so air poor air, air dispersion and all that stuff, I mock it. This place has the cleanest air that I've ever seen. It's awesome here. In any case, God cares about the planet. He does care about it. And those who destroy the earth, he says he's going to destroy. And so there's all kinds of uh, things that are happening during that time that are causing the destruction of the earth and he's going to be taking care of it. God's got all that stuff um, in his hand. It says, then the temple of God was opened in heaven and the ark of his covenant was seen in the temple and there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, and earthquake and great hail. And this is one of the subjects that's come up uh, routinely as we've been going through the book of Revelation, the whole thing with the Ark of the Covenant. You know that it, it was a, a gold box, a gold covered box that um, held the Ten Commandments um, on the inside of it and also Aaron's rod that budded. And it also um, held a golden pot of manna, okay? and it represented the throne of God. And one of the questions that comes up all the time is whether or not the Ark of the Covenant will be found uh, in the third temple, in that temple that's gonna be reconstructed. If it is, that would be just cool, but it doesn't need to be. And there are some people who think that the Ark of the Covenant was taken up into heaven because of this passage. The temple of God was opened in heaven and the Ark of his Covenant was seen in his temple. And I don't think that, and the reason I don't think that is because there are two arcs of the covenant. There was the heavenly ark of the covenant and there's the earthly ark of the covenant. The Bible talks about the fact that the things that were put into the temple and the tabernacle were copies of the things that are in heaven. In Hebrews 8, 5, it says of the priests that they serve the copy and shadow 
of the heavenly things as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle for he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. And then in Hebrews 9, 24, it says, for Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. And so the tabernacle and the temple were copies of things that were in heaven. And so as we've been going through the book of Revelation, we've seen the altar. Remember the souls under the altar? And that's, the, that's a picture of the bronze altar. We've seen uh, the altar of incense, the golden altar. That was something that was in the tabernacle. And so we have the Ark of the Covenant here. And people wonder if the Ark of the Covenant is needed uh, for, the, for temple worship. And um, the answer to that is no. In the second temple, the temple that Jesus went to, they didn't have the Ark of the Covenant there. There was just a, a bare piece of ground that they would come in and they would sprinkle blood on it when they were offering sacrifices. So there was no Ark of the Covenant in the temple that Jesus went to. Um, and in fact, there's a passage in Jeremiah 3.16 that says this, then it shall come to pass when you are multiplied and increased in the land in those days, says the Lord, that they will say no more the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. It shall not come to mind, nor shall they remember it, nor shall they visit it, nor shall it be made anymore. So I don't, I don't know if that's a passage that's referring to this whole situation. It is a passage that's referring specifically to the temple that Jesus builds in the, in the millennium. Um, but in any case, the Bible doesn't teach that the Ark of the Covenant needs to be in the temple for it to happen. But there is an Ark of, of the Covenant in heaven, and it represents God's throne. And that's, the, that's again, what you have there. Okay, so that's chapter 11. And let me just wrap it up with this. You know, I've been going through and talking about judgment um, a whole lot because you have that in this passage. And one of the things that we read in Romans chapter two is that um, the Bible talks about the fact that it's the goodness of God that leads you to repentance. It's not the judgment of God necessarily that leads people to repentance. It's the goodness of God that leads people to repentance. And the idea there is that God never starts off with judgment. He just doesn't. What he starts off with is, is his goodness. And I don't know if this has happened to you, but there have been times where, where I've just blown it big time uh, before God and, and just felt like a total jerk and I come before him. And all, I, all that happens to me is I get blessed. And there are, there are times when I know that I've been out of line with what God wants me to do and God blesses me anyway. And I don't, I don't know if you've had that happen. There've been times where I've been in worship and I'm just like repenting before God and he's just pouring out his love on me. I'm like, God, you gotta stop. I just, I, you know, I feel bad enough. It's kind of like that whole guilt thing that your parents do with you. You know, well, you know, I know that you've done that, but I just love you anyway. And they go on and on like that. And it's like, oh, shut up. Don't say that anymore. Why don't you just beat me? You know, <laughs> do something else. And sometimes that's exactly what I feel like before God. Because what he's doing is he's tweaking my conscience. He's coming along and he's, doing a, he, he's showing me how good he is and how much he loves me because that is the way that he would rather get me to turn. He would rather do that than ever you know, pull out the heavenly paddle and give me a spanking, much less judgment. He would rather do that and that's how he always starts first. And you know what people do with that? If they're not repentant, if they've got hard hearts, what happens with that is God blesses them despite the fact that they're in sin and they take that as God's approval. It's not God's approval. It's, it's God trying to get you to turn. It's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. And he always starts out with that. He always starts out with his goodness. And if goodness doesn't work, then what he does is he starts turning up the heat. And he doesn't do it all in, you know, he doesn't go from, you know, zero to high. He doesn't do it that way. He turns it up a little bit at a time. See if he can get you to turn around. But he will finally put you in a position where you're flat on your back looking up into heaven and he goes, and he'll put you there and he'll go, hi there. Now are you going to pay attention? Why do I always have to bring out the heavenly two by four when I'm dealing with you? What's going on? You know, that kind of thing. And again, it's because God's good and he wants you to turn and he wants you to, you know, again, just be real. And so you, again, you need to understand that. If you're here this morning, and you don't have a relationship with God or you don't know if you do. You know, if, I, you know, if all this stuff about judgment and all the things that you've done and all that kind of stuff has been scaring the snot out of you or 
You're getting mad over the whole thing. That's a good indication that there's some problems between you and the Lord. And I'll tell you right now that the major problem may be, if you're not somebody who's committed your life to Christ, the major problem may be that you don't know him at all, that you're on the outside of this whole thing. And you don't want to be in a position where you're being judged by God. You know, I don't want to be in a position where I'm being judged by God. But you certainly don't want to be in a position where you're being judged by God. And that's not what God wants to do in your life. What he wants to do is bring you into the family. And it is a family. And he is the dad. And he is in charge. And all that stuff. But it's a family. And he wants to bring you into the family. And he wants to bring you into heaven. And he wants to bring you there, not based on how good you are, but on how good he is. And the alternative is just judgment with the unrighteous. Now, God puts it off for a long time, and he has. He's put it off for a long time. And you're never going to find God in the times that we're living in right now just going around blasting people. He doesn't do it. He puts it off for a very long time. But there's coming a time when he's going to be done. And that time is not in the, in the, in the not-too-distant future. And you need to get things right with him before that ever happens. So, have you ever committed your life to Jesus? Do you know that if you died today that you would go to heaven? Do you know that? And if you don't, there's no reason for that. There's no reason for that. Jesus said that you could know that you know that you're going to heaven. The Bible talks about the, the assurance of salvation. This is what the Bible says. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. It's that simple. We started this whole study off with Psalm 2, and it says, kiss the Son lest he be angry and you perish. And there's a, there needs to be a kissing of the son, a time where you finally bow to him, you finally come to him, and you come in submission. Sorry, but that's what everybody in this room has done. We've come in submission to him. We've realized that there's somebody bigger than us and that we need to get things straight with him. And that's submission. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him is how that psalm ends. And it'll be the same for you. Blessed are you if you put your trust in him. So have you ever committed your life to Christ? And do you want to? I'm going to give you a chance to do that right now. Um, I'm going to ask you guys to bow your heads. And while, I'm, while we have our heads bowed, I'm going to pray. And I'm going to ask those of you who want to give your life to Christ, who want to get things straight between you and the Lord, to raise your hands. And then at the end of that whole thing, I'm going to ask you to stand up. And I do mean stand up and pray with me a prayer asking Christ to come into your life. So let's do that right now. Lord Jesus, we just thank you, um, God, that you're a God who's holy and you're righteous and you always do it right. And there's coming a time when um, we're going to be standing before you giving an account of our life. And you're gonna be asking us specifically what we did with your son. And Lord, for most of us in this room, um, we've received you. We've asked you to come into our life and we've committed our lives to following you. But Lord, there may be some, some in this room that haven't. And God, I just pray that you'd be working on their hearts and drawing them to you so they could have the same joy and the same peace that we have in following you. We've been talking a lot about um, not being plastic and being real before you. And God, I know that some of the people that are in this room are in this room because they're sitting next to somebody who they realized is not plastic. And when they talk about Jesus, it's not some religious game. It's, there's a reality there. And Father, I know that you want to give them the same reality. So Lord, I just uh, pray that you give them boldness. And while your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, if you're here this morning and you know that you need Jesus, you want to know that you know that you're going to heaven, you want to have your sins forgiven, you want God to throw them away and never remember them again, you want to know that you're going to be right with God when you die or when he comes back. If that's you, why don't you raise your hand up? I'm gonna pray for you. Back over here on my left. God bless you. Raise it up high so I can see it. This is your opportunity to come to Jesus on my right. God bless you. You may have gone to church most of your life. You may never have walked into a church before this day. It doesn't matter. Jesus wants you. He wants you to be with him. And he certainly doesn't want to judge you. In the back, God bless you. Up in the front, God bless you, man. Anybody else? Over on my right. 
the middle. Bless you. Last moment. You know that you need to make things right with God. This is your chance. Don't walk out without taking it. Okay. Let me pray for you guys. God, thank you for these that have raised their hands and just pray that, again, Lord, you give them the boldness to be able to stand up for you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you guys that raise your hands, why don't you look up at me? I'm going to pray a prayer with you now. This is going to be a prayer asking Jesus to come into your life. But, but Jesus said that if you'll confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. And so one of the things that I do with people is I have them stand up when they pray. And that's just you saying, I'm following Jesus and I don't care what people think. And um, so that's what I want to do with you right now. So don't even hesitate. All you guys that raise your hands, why don't you stand up? Over here, back in the back over here. There's somebody over here. All right. And I'm going to pray this prayer. And obviously, you need to be praying this prayer for real before God. That whole thing with not being plastic, this is, this is where it comes in. Um, God knows you. You don't, have to, you don't have to pick yourself apart on this whole thing. You're repentant before God. God knows it. And so you just need to mean this from your heart. And I'm going to give you the words, and you just repeat them after me, okay? Okay, let's pray. Lord Jesus, come into my life. I know that I'm a sinner and that I sinned against you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Please write my name in heaven and make me a believer. I thank you that you love me and that you died for me, that you rose again from the dead and that you're coming back for me. Please fill me with your spirit and help me to live for you. I give my whole life to you now. In Jesus' name, amen.